Hi, I'm Annie Murphy-Paul, and I'm a science writer who covers research on thinking and learning. My latest book, The Extended Mind, makes the argument that we don't just think inside our heads. Rather, we think with our bodies, the spaces in which we learn and work, and our relationships with others. The genesis for this book came when I ran across a 1998 journal article written by two philosophers, Andy Clark and David Chalmers. Before reading the article, I'd been taking note of some very interesting developments in the fields I cover as a journalist. Research on embodied cognition was demonstrating that the sensations, movements, and gestures of the body play an essential role in our thought processes. Research on situated cognition was showing that where we are deeply affects how we think. And research on socially distributed cognition was establishing that we often think more efficiently and effectively when we think in concert with other people. I had a sense that these bodies of research were related in some way, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it until I started in on the Clark and Chalmers article. I was arrested by its very first line, which read, where does the mind stop and the rest of the world begin? I think most of us would assume, as I did then, that the mind stops at the skull. But the authors argued that, in fact, thinking is spread across a whole host of extra neural, that is, outside the brain, resources. I found this idea really provocative and really exciting. I felt like it posed a challenge to me as a science writer. If cognition doesn't just happen inside the head, then how exactly do all those factors outside the head affect the way we think? I set out to investigate, and the result is my book, The Extended Mind. Use your head. How many times have you heard that phrase? You've probably even said it to someone else, a son or daughter, a student, an employee. Maybe you've muttered it under your breath while struggling with a tricky problem or when counseling yourself to remain rational. Use your head. Whatever the problem, we believe that the brain can solve it. But what if our faith is misplaced? What if the common directive to use your head is misguided? We've been led to believe that the human brain is an all-purpose, all-powerful thinking machine. We're deluged with reports of discoveries about the brain's astounding abilities, its lightning quickness and its protean plasticity. We're told that the brain is a fathomless wonder, the most complex structure in the universe. But when we clear away the hype, we confront the fact that the brain's capacities are actually quite constrained and specific. The less heralded scientific story of the past several decades has been researchers' growing awareness of the brain's limits. The human brain is limited in its ability to pay attention, limited in its capacity to remember, limited in its facility with abstract concepts, and limited in its power to persist at a challenging task. This is why we need to learn how to think outside the brain. Thinking outside the brain means skillfully engaging entities external to our heads, the feelings and movements of our bodies, the physical spaces in which we learn and work, and the minds of the other people around us, drawing them into our own mental processes. By reaching beyond the brain to recruit these extra neural resources, we're able to focus more intently, comprehend more deeply, and create more imaginatively, to entertain ideas that would be literally unthinkable by the brain alone. The idea that thought happens not only inside the skull, but out in the world, is admittedly a radically new way of thinking about thinking. It may not feel easy or natural to adopt, but a growing mass of evidence generated within several scientific disciplines suggests that it's a much more accurate rendering of how human cognition actually works. Thinking is an act of continuous assembly and reassembly that draws on resources external to the brain. The good news is that we've long been doing this, that we already think outside the brain. The bad news is that we tend to do it haphazardly, without much intention or skill. We're not trained to use bodily movements and gestures to understand highly conceptual subjects like science and mathematics, or to come up with novel and original ideas. Schools don't teach students how to restore their depleted attention with exposure to nature and the outdoors, or how to arrange their study spaces so that they extend intelligent thought. Teachers and managers don't demonstrate how abstract ideas can be turned into physical objects that can be manipulated and transformed to achieve insights and solve problems. 
Employees aren't shown how the social practices of imitation and vicarious learning can shortcut the process of acquiring expertise. Classroom groups and workplace teams aren't coached in scientifically validated methods of increasing the collective intelligence of their members. Our ability to think outside the brain has been left almost entirely uneducated and undeveloped. This near universal neglect represents an auspicious opportunity, a world of unrealized potential. Until recently, science shared the larger culture's neglect of thinking outside the brain, but this is no longer the case. Psychologists, cognitive scientists, and neuroscientists are now able to provide a clear picture of how extra neural inputs shape the way we think. Even more promising, they offer practical guidelines for enhancing our thinking through the use of these outside the brain resources. Such developments are unfolding against the backdrop of a broader shift in how we understand the mind, and by extension, how we understand ourselves. Interoception is an awareness of the inner state of the body. Just as we have sensors that take in information from the outside world, we have sensors inside our bodies that send our brains a constant flow of data from within. These sensations are generated in places all over the body, in our internal organs, our muscles, even in our bones, and then travel via multiple pathways to a structure in the brain called the insula. These internal reports are merged with several other streams of information, our active thoughts and memories, sensory inputs gathered from the external world, and integrated into a single snapshot of our present condition, a sense of how I feel in the moment, as well as a sense of the actions we must take to maintain a state of internal balance. Now here's where things get really interesting. Interoceptive awareness can be deliberately cultivated. A series of simple exercises can put us in touch with these internal messages giving us access to knowledge that we already possess, but that is ordinarily excluded from consciousness. Knowledge about ourselves, about other people, and about the worlds through which we move. Once we establish contact with this informative internal source, we can make wise use of what it has to tell us. To make sounder decisions, for example, to respond more resiliently to challenges and setbacks, to savor more fully the intensity of our emotions, while also managing them more skillfully, and to connect with others with more sensitivity and insight. To understand how interoception can act as such a rich repository, it's important to recognize that the world is full of far more information than our conscious minds can process. Fortunately, we're also able to collect and store the volumes of information we encounter on a non-conscious basis. As we proceed through each day, we're continuously apprehending and storing regularities in our experience, tagging them for future reference. Through this information gathering and pattern identifying process, we come to know things, but we're typically not able to articulate the content of such knowledge or to ascertain just how we came to know it. This trove of data remains mostly under the surface of consciousness, and that's usually a good thing. Its submerged status preserves our limited stores of attention and working memory for other uses. A study led by cognitive scientist Paul Lewicki demonstrates this process in microcosm. Participants in Lewicki's experiment were directed to watch a computer screen on which a cross-shaped target would appear, then disappear, then reappear in a new location. Periodically, they were asked to predict where the target would show up next. Over the course of several hours, the participants' predictions grew more and more accurate they had figured out the pattern behind the target's movements. But they couldn't put this knowledge into words, even when the experimenters offered them money to do so. The movements of the target operated according to a pattern too complex for the conscious mind to accommodate. But the capacious realm that lies below consciousness was more than roomy enough to contain it. If our knowledge of these patterns is not conscious, how then can we make use of it? The answer is that when a potentially relevant pattern is detected, it's our interoceptive faculty that tips us off. With a shiver or a sigh, a quickening of the breath or a tensing of the muscles, the body is rung like a bell to alert us to this useful and otherwise inaccessible information. Though we typically think of the brain as telling the body what to do, 
Just as much the body guides the brain with an array of subtle nudges and prods. People who are more aware of their bodily sensations are better able to make use of their non-conscious knowledge. One way to enhance such internal awareness is through mindfulness meditation. This practice has been found to increase sensitivity to internal signals and even to alter the size and activity of that key brain structure, the insula. One particular component that appears to be especially effective is known as the body scan. Mindfulness pioneer John Kabat-Zinn, now a professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, describes the body scan as an attentional sweep of the body, starting with the toes of the left foot, shifting the attention to the sole of the foot, the heel, the ankle, and so on, throughout the entire body. If our attention should wander during the exercise, we can gently guide it back to the part of the body that is the object of focus. Kabat-Zinn recommends doing the body scan at least once a day. The aim of this practice is to bring non-judgmental awareness to any and all feelings that arise within the body. In the rush of everyday life, we may ignore or dismiss these internal signals. If they do come to our notice, we may react with impatience or self-criticism. The body scan trains us to observe such sensations with interest and equanimity. The body scan trains us to observe our internal sensations with interest and equanimity. But tuning into these feelings is only a first step. The next step is to name them. Attaching a label to our interoceptive sensations allows us to begin to regulate them. Without such a ton of self-regulation, we may find our feelings overwhelming or we may misinterpret their source. Research shows that the simple act of giving a name to what we're feeling has a profound effect on the nervous system immediately dialing down the body's stress response. In an experiment conducted by researchers at the University of California, Los Angeles, study subjects were required to give a series of impromptu speeches in front of an audience, a reliable way to induce anxiety. Half of the participants were then asked to engage in what researchers call affect labeling, filling in responses to the prompt, I feel blank, while the other half were asked to complete a neutral shape matching task. The affect labeling group showed steep declines in heart rate and skin conductance compared to the control group, whose levels of physiological arousal remained high. Brain scanning studies offer further evidence of the calming effect of affect labeling. Simply naming what is felt reduces activity in the amygdala, the brain structure involved in processing fear and other strong emotions. Meanwhile, thinking in a more involved way about feelings and the experiences that evoked them actually produces greater activity in the amygdala. The practice of affect labeling, like the body scan, is a kind of mental training intended to get us into the habit of noting and naming the sensations that arise in our bodies. Psychologists recommend keeping two things in mind as we try it out. The first is to be as prolific as possible. The UCLA scientists reported that study participants who came up with a larger number of terms for what they were feeling subsequently experienced a greater reduction in their physiological arousal. The second is to be as granular as possible. That is to choose words that are precise and specific when describing what we feel. Accurately distinguishing among interoceptive sensations is associated with making sounder decisions, acting less impulsively, and planning ahead more successfully, perhaps because it gives us a clearer sense of what we need and what we want. Scientists have long known that overall physical fitness supports cognitive function. In recent years, however, researchers have begun to explore an exciting additional possibility that single bouts of physical activity can enhance our cognition in the short term. By moving our bodies in certain ways, that is, we're immediately able to think more intelligently. Research has shown that moderate intensity exercise, practiced for a moderate length of time, improves our ability to think both during and immediately after the activity. The positive changes documented by scientists include an increase in the capacity to focus attention and resist distraction, greater verbal fluency and cognitive flexibility, 
enhanced problem solving and decision making abilities, and increased working memory, as well as more durable long term memory for what is learned. The proposed mechanisms by which these changes occur include heightened arousal, increased blood flow to the brain, and the release of a number of neurochemicals, which increase the efficiency of information transmission in the brain and which promote the growth of neurons or brain cells. The beneficial mental effects of moderately intense exercise have been shown to last for as long as two hours after exercise ends. The encouraging implication of this research is that we have it within our power to induce in ourselves a state that is ideal for learning, creating, and engaging in other kinds of complex cognition by exercising briskly just before we do so. As things stand, however, we don't often take intentional advantage of this opportunity. Our culture conditions us to see mind and body as separate, and so we separate, in turn, our periods of thinking from our bouts of exercise. Consider how many of us make our visits to the gym only after work, for example, or on weekends. Instead, we should be figuring out how to incorporate bursts of physical activity into the workday and the school day, which means rethinking how we approach our breaks. Lunch breaks, coffee breaks, downtime between tasks or meetings, all become occasions to use exercise to maneuver our brains into an optimally functioning state. For children, this is precisely the role played by recess. Research shows that kids return from a session on the playground better able to focus their attention and to engage their executive function faculties. Yet at schools all over the country, recess has been reduced or even eliminated in order to generate more seat time spent on academic learning. The notion that time away from concentrated mental work is effectively time wasted is one of several wrong-headed notions we hold regarding breaks. Wrong-headed in this case because the ability to attend to such work declines steadily over time and is actually refreshed by a bout of bodily exertion. Parents, teachers, and administrators who want students to achieve academically should be advocating for an increase in physically active recess time. Another misguided idea about breaks is that they should be used to rest the body so as to fortify us for the next round of mental labor. Yet numerous studies have shown that it's through exerting the body that our brains become ready for the kind of knowledge work so many of us do today. The best preparation for such metaphorical acts as wrestling with ideas or running through possibilities is to work up an actual sweat. Instead of languidly sipping a latte before tackling a difficult project, we should be taking an energetic walk around the block. There's one more erroneous assumption about breaks to address. We imagine that we're replenishing the brain's depleted resources when we spend our breaks doing something that feels different from work, scrolling through Twitter, checking the news, looking at Facebook, the problem is that such activities engage the same brain regions and draw down the same mental capital we use to do our cognition-centric jobs. We resume our duties just as frazzled as before the pause, and maybe more so. Turning coffee breaks into what some public health experts call movement breaks allows us to return to our work a bit smarter than when we left it. Gesture is our first language. Well before babies can talk, they're waving, beckoning, holding up their arms in a wordless signal, pick me up. As we grow older, however, and speaking becomes increasingly dominant, gesture tends to get devalued, often scorned as hapless hand-waving and disparaged as showy or gauche. Yet gesture provides an alternate channel of communication, every bit as significant as the verbal one. A profusion of extra-verbal meaning is continually being offered and received. We may choose our own words carefully and listen closely to what others say, yet still fail to notice a substantial proportion of the communication that is actually occurring. Research shows that moving our hands advances our understanding of abstract or complex concepts, reduces our cognitive load, and improves our memory. People are also more likely to remember what we've said when we deliver gestures along with our words. In one study, Subjects who had watched a videotaped speech were 33% more likely to recall a point from the talk if it was accompanied by a gesture. This effect, detected immediately after the subjects viewed the recording, grew even more pronounced with the passage of time. 
30 minutes after watching the speech, subjects were more than 50% more likely to remember the gesture accompanied points. The special strengths of gesture are especially valuable in the effort to persuade or enlist others. Such movements visually place the gesture at the center of the action, situating him at the locus of agency and control. When he talks, his words may describe or extol or explain, but when he gestures, he acts on the world, if only symbolically. At the same time, the gesturer's motions render an abstract idea in human scale, embodied terms, making it easier for onlookers to mentally simulate the gesturer's point of view for themselves. Perhaps most important, gesture can bring an uncertain future into the observable present, imbuing it with a realness that we can almost touch. Using gesture in this way can confer an enormous advantage. In a study published in 2019, researchers found that company founders who deployed the skilled use of gesture in their pitches were 12% more likely to attract funding for their new ventures. The gestural advantage is one that all of us can benefit from. Whether we're offering projections for next quarter, presenting a proposal for a project, or explaining why a change we'd like to make would be well advised. And it doesn't just apply when in person. A number of studies have demonstrated that instructional videos that include gesture produce significantly more learning for the people who watch them. Viewers direct their gaze more efficiently, pay more attention to essential information, and more readily transfer what they've learned to new situations. So when selecting instructional videos, be sure to look for those in which the teacher's hands are visible and active. And if you yourself are called upon to teach online or just to communicate via Zoom or another video conferencing platform, make sure that others can see your moving hands. Research suggests that making these motions will improve your performance. People who gesture as they teach on video, it's been found, speak more fluently and articulately, make fewer mistakes, and present information in a more logical and intelligible fashion. The field of cognitive science commonly compares the human brain to a computer, but the influence of place reveals a major limitation of this analogy. While a laptop works the same way, whether it's being used at the office or while we're sitting in a park, the brain is deeply affected by the setting in which it operates, and nature provides particularly rich and fertile surroundings with which to think. That's because our brains and bodies evolved to thrive in the outdoors. Over hundreds of thousands of years of dwelling outside, the human organism became precisely calibrated to the characteristics of its verdant environment, tuning our minds to the frequencies of the organic world. The mismatch between the stimuli we evolved to process and the sights and sounds that regularly confront our senses now has the effect of depleting our limited mental resources. We're left frazzled, fatigued, and prone to distraction simply as a function of the hours we spend in settings for which we're biologically ill-equipped. Just how much of our lives unfolds inside buildings and vehicles? According to scientists' time use studies, only about 7% of adults' time is now spent outdoors. Children don't fare much better. Only 26% of mothers report that their kids play outside every day. Such trends are likely to continue. More than half of Earth's humans now live in cities, and by 2050, that figure is predicted to reach almost 70%. Yet despite these massive shifts in culture, our biology remains identical to that of our progenitors. Even now, our brains and bodies respond to nature in ways that reveal the deep imprint of our evolution in the outdoors. Not only do we prefer natural settings, they actually help us to think better, in part by relieving our stress and reestablishing our mental equilibrium. Drivers who travel along tree-lined roads, for example, recover more quickly from stressful experiences and handle emerging stresses with more calm than do people who drive along roads crowded with billboards, buildings, and parking lots. Laboratory studies of people who are given a challenging math test or are subjected to sharp questioning by a panel of judges report that subsequent contact with nature calms their nervous system, returning them to a state of psychological balance in the wake of such trying experiences. The more stressed individuals are, the more benefit they derive from exposure to nature. The sights and sounds of nature help us rebound from stress. 
They can also help us out of a mental rut. Rumination is psychologists' term for the way we may fruitlessly visit and revisit the same negative thoughts. On our own, we can find it difficult to pull ourselves out of this cycle, but exposure to nature can extend our ability to adopt more productive thought patterns. Gregory Bratman, an assistant professor at the University of Washington, asked study participants to undergo a brain scan and to complete a measure of ruminative thinking before taking a 90-minute walk outside. Half the participants strolled through a quiet, leafy, natural area. The other half walked along a busy roadway. Upon returning to the lab, all the participants took the ruminative thinking measure and had their brain scanned for a second time. People who had spent the previous hour and a half in nature had become less preoccupied by the negative aspects of their lives. In addition, an area of the brain associated with rumination, the subgenual prefrontal cortex, was less active than before the nature walk. The people who had walked alongside a busy roadway gained no such relief. Rumination is especially common in those who are depressed, and research has shown that a walk in nature lifts the mood of people diagnosed with depression. It also improves their memory. The obsessive cycling through negative thoughts that many depressed people experience consumes a significant portion of their mental resources, adversely affecting their ability to recall important information, a deficit that time and nature helps ameliorate. Apart from offering shelter from the elements, the most critical function of a built interior is simply to give us a quiet place to think. And yet, for many of us, that quiet space has now largely disappeared. In every sort of building, homes, schools, offices, an unstructured open space has come to feel preferable to a closed off space. This is especially prevalent when it comes to the places where we work. By the beginning of the 21st century, some 70 to 80% of American office workers labored in open plan rooms. Why did the wall-less workspace triumph over the private office? For one thing, it's cheaper. Open plan office space costs as much as 50% less per employee than more traditional office layouts because of its smaller footprint and lower interior construction costs. But there was also a theoretical rationale behind the enthusiasm. Take down the walls, throw everybody together in one big room, and communication will flow with increased collaboration and creativity sure to follow. And in fact, it is the case that people who work near one another are more likely to communicate and collaborate. This finding was first demonstrated more than 40 years ago by Thomas Allen, a professor at MIT who drew what has come to be known as the Allen Curve. The curve describes a consistent relationship between physical distance and frequency of communication. The rate of people's interactions declines exponentially with the distance between the spaces where they work. This would mean, for example, that people sitting six feet apart are four times more likely to talk regularly than people seated 65 feet apart. Allen found that 50 meters, about 165 feet, was the cutoff point for regular information exchange. Beyond that distance, routine communication effectively ceased. People who are located close to one another are more likely to encounter one another, and it's these encounters that spark informal exchanges interdisciplinary ideas, and fruitful collaboration. But fruitful proximity is one thing. Continual distraction is another. Appealing though it may be to modern sensibilities, the open plan workspace is in direct conflict with the realities of human biology, especially when it comes to performing complex, cognitively demanding work. That's because the brain evolved to continually monitor its immediate environment, to be, in effect, distractible, lest nearby sounds or movements signal a danger to be avoided or an opportunity to be seized. And organizational environments are full of the kind of stimuli that distract us the most. First, humans are especially attuned to the presence of novelty. The pull of the novel on our attention is an efficient evolved strategy. It would be a waste of our time and energy to keep noticing the many things around us that don't change from day to day. But our selective attraction to the fresh and new becomes a problem when we operate in environments that are hubs of constant activity and change. Second, we're especially attuned to the sound of speech. Any ambient noise can grab our attention, but intelligible speech is particularly distracting because its semantic meaning is processed by our brains 
whether or not we want to be listening. What's more, the speech we can't help overhearing is processed by the same brain regions we employ to carry out the kind of knowledge work done at the office, like analyzing data or writing a report. Third, we're especially attuned to the nuances of social interactions, alert to what people say to one another and to what we think they will say. In an effort to master our interpersonal world, we're constantly making predictions about what will unfold in the social exchanges that go on around us. So if you're constantly finding it challenging to get your work done, consider changing the environment to allow for some privacy and thereby reduce distractions. Plus there's a bonus benefit. As neuroscientist Moshi Barr has found, when people are relieved of the cognitive load imposed by their environment, i.e. given privacy, they immediately become more creative. Our culture and our institutions tend to fixate on the individual. In business and in education, in public and private life, we emphasize individual competition over joint cooperation. We resist what we consider conformity, at least in its overt, organized form, and we look with suspicion on what we call groupthink. In some measure, this wariness may be justified. Uncritical group thinking can lead to foolish and even disastrous decisions. But the limitations of excessive cognitive individualism are becoming increasingly clear as well. Individual cognition is simply not sufficient to meet the challenges of a world in which information is so abundant, expertise is so specialized, and issues are so complex. These days, a single mind laboring on its own is at a distinct disadvantage in solving problems or generating new ideas. Something beyond solo thinking is required, the generation of a state that is entirely natural to us as a species, and yet one that has come to seem quite strange and exotic, the group mind. A host of laboratory experiments, as well as countless instances of real-world rituals, show that it's possible to activate the group mind to flip the hive switch, as it were, by hacking behavioral synchrony and physiological arousal. The key lies in creating a certain kind of group experience, real-time encounters in which people act and feel together in close physical proximity. Yet our schools and companies are increasingly doing just the opposite. Aided by technology, we are creating individual, asynchronous, atomized experiences for students and employees from personalized playlists of academic lessons to go-at-your-own-pace online training modules. Then we wonder why our groups don't cohere, why group work is often frustrating and disappointing, and why thinking with groups doesn't extend our intelligence. Why is our current approach so wrongheaded? It assumes that information is information, however it is encountered, that tasks are tasks, no matter how we take them on. But in fact, the new science of the group mind is demonstrating that we think differently, and often better, when we think as part of a close-knit group rather than as individuals. This is particularly the case regarding our attention and our motivation. The nature of these two states is altered in meaningful ways when we enter them collectively instead of alone. First, attention. The phenomenon that psychologists call shared attention occurs when we focus on the same objects or information at the same time as others. The awareness that we are focusing on a particular stimulus along with other people leads our brains to endow that stimulus with a special significance. We then allocate more mental bandwidth to that material, processing it more deeply. As a result, we both learn and remember things better when we attend to them with other people and we're more likely to act on information that has been attended to along with other people. Motivation is also different when we experience it as a member of a group. Our willingness to persevere can be enhanced when our efforts are made on behalf of a group we care about. Membership in a group can be a potent source of motivation if we feel a genuine sense of belonging to the group and if our personal identity feels firmly tied to the group and its success. When these conditions are met, Group membership acts as a form of intrinsic motivation. That is, our behavior becomes driven by factors internal to the task, such as the satisfaction we get from contributing to a collective effort, rather than by external rewards, such as money or public recognition. And as psychologists have amply documented, intrinsic motivation is more powerful 
more enduring, and more easily maintained than the extrinsic sort. It leads us to experience the work as more enjoyable and to perform it more capably. Experiencing ourselves as part of a collective we, rather than as a singular I, changes the way we direct our focus and the way we allocate our energies, often in fortunate fashion. Yet so much in our every man for himself society conspires against the creation of a robust sense of we. Our emphasis on individual achievement means that we're failing to reap the rich benefits of shared attention and shared motivation. Even when groups do exist in name, they are often weakly bonded. Psychologists have found that groups differ widely on what they call entitivity or groupiness. Some portion of the time and effort we devote to cultivating our individual talents could more productively be spent on forming teams that are genuinely groupy. In order to foster a sense of groupiness, there are a few deliberate steps we can take. First, people who need to think together should learn together, in person, at the same time. The omnipresence of our digital devices can make it difficult to ensure that shared learning takes place, even among students gathered in a single classroom. Some years back, high school teacher Paul Barnwell realized that many of his students were physically present, but mentally absent during class. In a clever jujitsu move, Barnwell redirected his students' use of technology. He asked them to record one another with their smartphones and then analyze their own and their partner's conversational patterns. Before long, his students were holding lively class-wide conversations, thinking and acting more like a group and reaping the cognitive benefits that only a group can generate. Second, people who need to think together should train together in person at the same time. Research shows that teams that trained as a group collaborate more effectively commit fewer errors, and perform at a higher level than teams made up of people who were trained separately. Training together can also reduce the silo effect, a common phenomenon in which coworkers fail to communicate or collaborate across different departments and disciplines. Third, people who need to think together should feel together in person at the same time. Laboratory research, as well as research conducted with survivors of battlefield conflicts and natural disasters, has found that emotionally distressing or physically painful events can act as a kind of social glue that bonds the people who experience them together. But the emotions that unite a group need not be so harrowing. Studies have also determined that simply asking members to candidly share their thoughts and feelings with one another leads to improvements in group cohesion and performance. The fourth and final strategy for eliciting groupiness is this. People who need to think together should engage in rituals together, in person, at the same time. A ritual can be any meaningful organized activity in which members of a group take part together. If the rituals involve synchronized movement or shared physiological arousal, all the better. Research shows that when people walk or run together, they automatically and unconsciously match up their bodily movements. Even so ordinary a ritual as sharing a meal can make a difference in how well a group thinks together. Lakshmi Balachandra, an assistant professor of entrepreneurship at Babson College in Massachusetts, asked 132 MBA students to role play executives negotiating a complex joint venture agreement between two companies. In the simulation she arranged, the greatest possible profits would be created by parties who were able to discern the other side's preferences and then work collectively to maximize profits for the venture as a whole rather than merely considering their own company's interests. Balachandra found that participants who dined together while negotiating at a restaurant or over food brought into a conference room generated 12% higher profits on average than those who bargained while not eating. All of these approaches to generating groupiness are firmly grounded in our nature as embodied, situated, social beings. Their effectiveness depends on people moving, talking, and working together so closely that their brains and bodies fall into a joint rhythm. What I really love about the idea of the extended mind is that it offers us a new view of human potential. For me, it's made such a profound difference to realize 
that we all have these brains that are limited by their biology, limited by their evolutionary history, and yet we can transcend these limits by skillfully reaching outside the brain and bringing in all these rich resources that the world has to offer. We so often treat our brains like a workhorse. This brain-bound model inevitably leads to frustration and boredom, a lack of engagement, a loss of motivation. The theory of the extended mind tells us that it's more felicitous to think of the brain as playing the role of an orchestra conductor, tapping this flow of information over here, queuing up this source of insight over there. When we adopt this model, we immediately have all these options for extending our thinking in new directions. This conception of the mind tells us that we're not isolated individuals, we're not unfeeling machines, we're creatures of the world intimately connected to our bodies and our surroundings and to the other people in our lives.